I like hammocks. Why? Because they're fun. You lay in them, you rock back and forth, it's very pleasant. But the problem with that is when you're enjoying one, rocking back and forth, you're in inherently the worst position to continue making it happen. You can't really reach out, you know, it's tied back here, you can't really use your foot. So we need a way to continue making that happen. And I want to use weights, of course, in my quest to avoid using motors whenever reasonable. And an escapement mechanism, the type of thing in a clock that makes it go tick-tock, is seems like the best way to do it. It has very large, sort of spiky-looking gears, and this thing rocks back and forth catching it. Um, but the other problem with the hammock is that it's too big for this motion, in addition to being out of season right now. It's getting cold. So I need something smaller, which is basically the same thing. I think I'll use a cradle, like a baby cradle. I don't have any kids, but I'll get ahead of the fact, I guess, and you know, be ready <laughs> when I need one. Couple quick notes on the escapement here. The way that it works is that you have a weight or a spring which is trying to compel this gear here to move and the, whatever this piece is, I don't actually know what they're called, is re resisting that motion by going back and forth and then down low you can have a pendulum. And so it's regulating the speed of this. Um, and the way that I want to use it is that the pendulum obviously would be the cradle or the hammock um, the other advantage to a cradle being it takes less energy than a hammock, so we can work out things with less force on the gears. The problem with an escapement, though, from my research, is that it's not particularly efficient at transferring this energy into here. So what I really should say is an escapement-inspired mechanism, because this exact setup, especially with the amount of force that I'm thinking about, like a 30-40 pound weight, is probably going to be a lot of stress on these gears even if we went for metal, um, because there's a very small amount of contact area, and if you make it bigger, it drives the efficiency down even further. You may speculate that I pull some of these projects out of the air, but I make notes on my computer, and the timestamp for this one is from 2011, so it's been on my mind for a couple years now. Before going any further, I wanted to build a very rough prototype and estimate how much energy it takes to keep the pendulum swinging, so I don't get halfway into it and realize that it's a cool mechanism, but it only runs for 20 seconds or something silly like that. So saw horses and 2x4s it is. The side pieces are just there to provide air resistance, and our friend the 22-pound weight will stand in as simulated cargo. Yes, I realize that the mass of the pendulum shouldn't really matter, but as you can hear from the squeaking, friction is definitely real, and it's affected by mass, so we're going to include a reasonable amount. I want to estimate how much energy it takes to maintain the pendulum's motion. So from a beginning point over to the other side and back. And I thought about a lot of different ways to do this and I realized that really the simplest one was to compare the heights. So it's here on one swing and then when it comes to the next swing or when it returns it's right there. And what we can do is just pick a reference point and compare those heights. Then we can use potential energy is just mass times gravity times height to figure out how much energy was used during that swing. To do this I need to count how many swings are over a fixed distance. This block is about four inches which is actually not important the distance but I lay it on the ground and I count the number of swings when it's over top of that block by looking very carefully down the line at it. Then I mark the block's position on the ground and use a framing square to compare the actual heights. 11 and a half. And nine and seven eighths. We did our experiment and we know that it took 18 swings one time and 19 the other to decay that distance. So we're gonna go with 18 to be conservative and during that, it went from 11 and a half inches high over to 9 and 7 eighths, which is also a little bit conservative. So that's an inch and 5 eighths of vertical height lost. And what we're going to do here is compare our potential energy. And since it's MGH, 
to mgh, we're going to drop the g because it's on both sides of the equation and just use mass times height or weight since it's pounds. So we've got this inch and five eighths and the 18 swings. We're going to divide those, this divided by that, and we're going to get 0 0.09 inches per swing. That's how much height was lost on average during that pendulum, uh, you know, distance, which seemed reasonable for a cradle. Now that iron piece inside was 22 pounds, and I weighed the frame assembly underneath. That was 9.8. We'll call it 10. So this is going to be 32 pounds of total weight there, and we'll take 32 times 0.09, and we'll find out that it's about 2.9 pound inches per swing. This is how much energy it takes to maintain our pendulum in the current setup. Now that we know how much energy it takes, let's come up with a counterweight. So we'll say it's 30 pounds, and we're going to raise it 24 inches to charge it up. That's going to give us 720 inch pounds of energy. Now we're going to take this 720, divide it by 2.9 to come up with swings, and we're going to end up with 248 swings from that counterweight. That's how much we have. Now I've actually neglected to time uh, that uh, 18 swings, so we're going to go ahead and do that right now. We timed the swinging action, and we came up with actually quite a few more swings over those 4 inches than we had before, about 40%-ish, which just shows that we are ballparking right now. Ballparking. And so we have 248 swings. It took about 1.5 seconds per swing, which gives us 372 seconds from this much energy, or about 6.2 minutes. So that's about how much we could expect to get from a 30 pound weight 24 inches up. Maybe you could make that heavier. I'm aiming for about 10 minutes right now. I think that seems like a reasonable amount of time. It's time to think about the mechanism, but first I thought we'd put a coat of finish on some bookshelves and the underside of that counterweight desk. We know that we like the escapement, but we need to have our own take on it in order to try and drive up the efficiency. So this is going to represent our main axis with this being the pendulum going down. And what we need here is to have our counterweight wheel. This is trying to rotate like this. And so what we want it to do is to assist this one and let it rebound. We're not trying to drive it in both directions. We want to drive, drive, letting it rebound. So drive, rebound, drive, drive, giving it a boost, like pushing a, a kid on a swing, for example. And my original, my first thought on this was to use a one-way bearing. The first one-way bearing I thought of was from an RC car because they use them on the pull starter of the engine powered models. This engine is stiff from sitting for several years, but you can see that this, and normally there's a pull starter cord that comes off here, it rotates easily in one direction, and if it wasn't so stiff and seized up, it would rotate the engine in the other direction. And all that we have under here is a smooth shaft and a needle bearing where the needles sit in triangular shaped slots. And they jam one way, which allows it to go one way and not the other. If we couple it directly to the shaft, it's going to rewind the counterweight on the way back. It's one way. What we want it to do is to drive here, let it coast, come back, and drive again. What the one way is going to do is drive, coast, and rewind. Because on the way back, this can't go the opposite direction. I thought about a couple different ways that we could accomplish this, and it seemed that ultimately something like a skip tooth, or whatever you call it setup, would work best. Where we have this as our pendulum piece up here that's trying to go back and forth, 
and this outer gear rotates with teeth past this piece. It rotates it, and then there's an open space so it can rebound freely, and then this piece gets released again and drives it another partial rotation. A little more thought made me realize, though, that I didn't really need teeth. What I needed was tooth because there only needs to be one contact surface between these pieces. So we upgraded to this setup, which only has one contact surface. These would be staggered, obviously. And then I realized that this doesn't even need to be circular because it, don't, it only goes like this. So this will probably become a right angle, which makes that easier. Now the question of how do you lock this piece into place periodically, or lock and then unlock it. I think what we're gonna do here is to use a piece which actually goes in and out of the page like this. So when this one goes down, it'll pull it like this, which makes it extend into a notch on here, locking that. When it rebounds back up, it'll push it out of the way and release it. And that'll give you that lock unlock motion. I did a little drawing of it here, but that may not be entirely clear, especially since it's a different perspective. I hope all that was reasonably clear. It's still taking shape in my head, so it can be kind of difficult to lay it out in a straightforward manner. But over the next week, we're gonna build a prototype version of this. We already bought some hardware, and I hope you come back and see how it turns out.